It's been a great blessing to be with you and to open the Word of God with you, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ with you once again. It is a blessing to be here at home, away from home, and I'm thankful for all of your encouragement and all your words and prayers for us. Let's go ahead and, and focus in on Ephesians chapter 4. We want to remember what we went over this morning. We want to re- remember what we went over this morning and the fact that we looked at the doctrine to du- duty, this turning point in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4, verse 1, where we come to remember the salvation, and then we begin to look at how, what Christ wants in our lives, what fruit He wants. We remember, again, the, the, the theme of union with Christ and the importance of that in the book of Ephesians. We remember that the book of Ephesians is teaching about the glory of Jesus Christ being manifested in the salvation of his church. And each and every aspect of the salvation that we look at is by means of union with Christ. Union with Christ. This spiritual work that by grace we are given by the work of Christ We are included, we are elected, we are chosen before the foundation of the world because we're chosen in Christ. We are given new life in Christ, no longer dead in our sins because of Christ. We have been given reconciliation. We're not enemies with him anymore in the gospel, but we're given reconciliation, fellowship with him because of Christ. And so each and every aspect, each and every blessing that we look at In the book of Ephesians, we remember it's because we've been united with Christ by grace, by grace, by grace. And so this grace that God has given to to wicked, vile sinners like us teaches us and instructs us and gives us the great, not only uh, the, it gives us the will and the grace to do what he would want, what he would want. Remembering that gospel grace is key if we're to apply any of the aspects of discipleship or about sanctification, changing the way we speak, about anger, bitterness, corrupt words that come out of our mouths, loving one another, living pure sexually in, this, in sexual areas, walking with wisdom in respect to how we use the time, being filled with the Spirit, submitting wives, submitting to their husbands, husbands loving their wives, children obeying parents, living in a spiritual war. Remember that all of these aspects, all of these things, the responsibilities that we have to live out the Christian life are all made possible because of the grace that God has given. And so we, we also looked at the purpose behind what uh, God giving this instruction. Whenever we would read a text, we, especially when we get at practical commands, we want to consider who gave them, why did he give them. And so in this text, when we see God giving instruction about unity, we want to consider what is God trying to accomplish here? How is Christ being glorified through this? Why did he give these, in, these in instructions? And we looked at and we remind, were reminded of this morning how God has given these things so that it manifests His glory in the way that we obey Him and live in a way that is different in the world. We live in a way that is different in the world. In this church, you are to manifest the gospel in a way that's different in the world by the unity we have with one another, by the resolving of conflicts that we have with one another, by the humility that we have in order to resolve those conflicts, by speaking to one another in a different way, in a gentle way, by bearing with one another, trying to help them, others, to persevere in the faith, and working to the point of sweat for, to keep the unity, endeavoring to keep the unity. So remembering all those things, remember that Satan wants the opposite. Satan wants to destroy churches by creating disunity, by creating disunity. And so the, this is the instructions we've been given here by our Savior, and he wants to be his son to be glorified by us living out this responsibility. 
Okay, let's begin to work in through verses 4 to 6. We'll continue in chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. And we see the repetition of one. We have one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Seven ones. Seven ones. There's our outline. Seven ones, we have the foundation of unity. There's a reality that we have in common. There's a reality that we have in common that's thicker than blood. And it's these truths of the gospel. is that we worship a triune God, and we, we have the same salvation. We have these things in common. And these things in common with all true Christians throughout the world make us closer than blood, closer than family. These realities change us. These realities are what we are to remember and are essential in order to have unity. So we begin with the various ones. Let's begin in chapter 4. In chapter 4, it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. The repetition of one is purposeful, right? It sounds good to your ear as you read it, but it reminds us of the unity. It wouldn't be unified if it was it's like two, 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 and we list about a whole bunch of twos that we could find in the Bible. So Paul lists out a whole bunch of ones to say there's only one, and so we come together at that point. In other words, if I say, let's meet at the Statue of Liberty, there's only one. So we're going to be unified. It's going to bring us together if we say we're going to meet at that location as a point of illustration. So the point is that Paul is saying, look, at we have one in common, one body. There's not two bodies. There's not two peoples of God. There's not two spirits, one spirit. There's not two hopes. There's one hope here. And so this repetition of the word one is to rem remind us of, remember these, this truth. This truth is the foundation. This reality is what is our foundation in order to have unity. So he begins with one body. One body. Ferguson, Sinclair Ferguson notes about this, how Paul is the only one who likes to say, use this term, one body, or the body of Christ. And he uses it in various places. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Colossians 3. Here in Ephesians, he repeats it, the one body. And what Ferguson speculates is perhaps in, Saul, in Paul's conversion, when he was on the road to Damascus, and Christ knocks him off his horse and says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Remember that he was on the road to persecute the church. And here is where Jesus says, you're persecuting me. Jesus is the head and the church is his body. And so the way that, again, reminding us back to uh, Pastor Dale's favorite doctrine, the union of Christ, that because of our union with Christ, a spiritual union in salvation, that Christ refers to his church as his body. And so perhaps he's right when he says, um, when Christ says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Referring to Christ, referring to his own body as the church. And that one body, we remember we're one body uh, because we're reconciled. We're reconciled, like we read in chapter 2, verse 16, where it says, and that he might reconcile both to God in one body, in one body, through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. And so this applies to the local and universal church. One body. One body in nation, different nations, and one body in different nations represented in this room. One body in different, from di believers in different countries. One body in believers throughout church history. And so we can say, Martin Luther is my brother. Charles Spurgeon is my brother. Athanasius is my brother. Taking throughout different people, throughout different people in church history, through, through different, different times, different places in the world, 
that we've never seen or we've never known, but we recognize we have these things in common with them, and these things are thicker than blood. We move to the next one, one spirit, one spirit. Chapter 4, verse 4, there's one body and one spirit. When your, your translation has a capital S, that's a good thing. Communicating, this is referring to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's not simply the same attitude we have. We have the same object of worship in the, the Holy Spirit, the same one who has given us new life, the same one who continues to work in us, convicting us, the same one who has sealed us, who is the guarantee, his work in us is the guarantee of the future redemption that is to come. We have, in chap- Ephesians says in chapter 2, verse 18, access to the Father through the Spirit. You would expect it to say through the Son. But here saying in, in 2.18, through the Spirit. He works in us, in salvation, adopting us and giving us the same desire that we would cry out, Abba, Father. That's the work of the Spirit. We have that same fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And we're the, in chapter 2, verse 22, says we're the dwelling place of God by the Spirit, the same Spirit. The same Spirit. And we're strengthened in chapter 3, verse 16 says, we're strengthened in the inner man by the Spirit. So if you just take the book of Ephesians and we just look at how Paul speaks about the Spirit in the book of Ephesians, these things, as Christians, these are the things we share. And these things, the things that we share, make it so that we, we must be united. We must resolve our conflicts. We must endeavor. We must ha- live out these responsibilities. We share the same regeneration, the same sanctification, the same work of faith, the same fruit of the Spirit, the same Spirit. And then in chapter 4, we switch to another one. We spoke of one body, one Spirit, and now he says, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. So Paul is looking forward now to something. We have the same thing that we look forward to. We have the same confident expectation. We hope because we have the same election, the same justification in the past, and we have the same work of the Spirit in the present in our lives, we now have look forward to the hope of the future, of what God will do. We share what God has done in the past, we share what God is doing in the present, and we share what God is going to do in the future in his return, in our glorification, this hope of your calling. And so Colossians 1.15 says we have the same hope in heaven. And Titus 1.2 says we have the same ho- um, hope of eternal life. We remember that formerly we had no hope. We shared that too. We shared that too. When we share our testimonies, we can share in our experiences of being saved, we recognize that same fact. We may have been from different places. We may have been, had different culture. We may have eaten different food. But one thing is that we share. We had no hope, and now we have hope. And that reality, that reality keeps us fixed. That reality keeps us fixed. If you think about another analogy, like a lighthouse, how do lighthouses, how do they work? How do they give a warning? Because they don't move. They don't move. They're a fixed reality. You're thankful. Ships move. Ships move and waves move. Wind moves. Weather moves. Lighthouses, they don't move. Praise God, they don't move. So they, because they don't move, because they're a, 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 a low... Because of that fact, they, you can use them as a point of safety. It's the same thing with these things. These things don't change. One body, one spirit, one hope of your calling. And we don't change with these ones. Praise God that there is only one body, one spirit, and one hope of your calling. That reality 
fix us, and teaches us, we need to be unified. Because what does change is our sinful hearts. What does change is our desire to be unified. What does change and fluctuates is the, our relationships with one another. And so that reality needs to motivate us. And you need to remember, I have the same spirit. I have the same hope. I have the same body. I have the same thing that is most important. What's most important? It can be easy for us to fix our eyes on things that are differences that are not most important. But we need this reminder. And so we switch to verse 5. Verse 5, we read another one. We've covered one body, one spirit, one hope, now one Lord. One Lord. We know this refers to Jesus. Jesus. Because verse 4 is clear, clearly referring to the spirit. Verse 6 one God and Father of all is clearly referring to the Father. So we're left to as one Lord referring to Jesus Christ. And this is the common New Testament way to refer to Jesus Christ. We have the same authority. We have the same King. We have the same love from Him. We have the same care from Him. The same protection. We submit to the same Lord. We have the same trust in Him. We want to obey Him. We share this common love for Him and come and worship of Him. And that's why you're here tonight, so you would worship Him. And this would go against the common idea of in, in people living in Ephesus of the common day, where Artemis or Diana would be, would be Lord in a very prideful, consider, a, a prideful point of Ephesus, their worship of Artemis or Diana. And so when we think of this term, Lord, it communicates how he is God, and it communicates how he's king. We remember that the Hebrew word Yahweh is translated in the Septuagint, is translated as kurios, or Lord. And so we, we remember that in this term of Lord, it communicates much to us. It communicates that he's our king, it communicates he's our God, it communicates how he, we um, his work also as our, our authority and how he reigns as the king. This is what we share. So what do we share? One, in verse 4, one body. We share the one spirit. We share one hope. We share one Lord in verse 5. And we share one faith. We share one faith. Here this is the content of the Christian faith. The same realities. We could say we share the same Bible that communicates the same rea truths, the same that describes the same Savior from Genesis to Revelation. We share the same content of the faith. We share this same baptism in verse 5. In verse 5, it describes we also have one baptism. One baptism. We remember that in the New Testament, when Paul speaks of baptism, water baptism, where it also communicates a reality of being of spirit baptism, of spirit baptism. And we read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14. Let's read 1 Corinthians 12. Verses 12 to 14, where Paul connects these two ideas. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14 says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So speaking of a unity and diversity, unity and diversity, one and yet diverse, the body. In verse 13, he says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we've all been made to drink of one, into one Spirit. For in the fact, the body is one, not one member, but many. So by the Spirit, we're immersed into the one body, the Spirit baptism, Spirit baptism. This is a work that happens at conversion, not a post-conversion experience. 
another common fact, another common thing that Christians share in, that we share in one baptism that symbolizes a greater reality, our union with Christ in salvation and our union with Christ in the body. So what are, the, what are our ones? What are our ones? What is the lighthouse that fixes us and gives us reality, a reality that we motivates us in order to work for unity, in order to do the hard thing? You look across and you think of that person at church that is difficult to get along with, and you think we share the same body, same spirit, same Lord, same faith, same baptism, same hope, and last of all, verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Here we have the description of God the Father. It's beautiful to see the Trinitarian nature of Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6, where we note the Spirit and the Jesus in verse 5, and in verse 6, the Father, God the Father. Only one God, one God, manifested in three persons. Those of you who teach the catechism to your children, the children are tired, so I won't ask them the question, but how many gods are there? <laughs> and manifested in how many persons? And if you change the question in the order of the question, do the children turn into heretics if they're not used to the particular order? I can see some parents nodding yes. <laughs> Sometimes you try and trick your children, right, and, and fix, switch the order in order to see if they understand what they're, what they're saying as we go through the catechism with them. So only one God, only one God, and here, that's how the verse 6 begins. Only one God and Father of all, but we observe the three persons of the Trinity in the, these small verses, and, and Father of all. And so describing the where we observe the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity here, we remember here in particular aspects of the Father that are brought out. He says, Father of all. This, applying this to the church, applying this in the context of those who are receiving this letter. Father of all true Christians. We share the same Father. That, that's why it's good to say brother, sister in the church. We share the same Father of all, and it says, who is above all. This is describing his authority over us. And now it says, and through all. God the Father is operating through Christians in order to glorify the Son in this world. So here, this through all is describing the, how God is glorifying Jesus Christ. By changing you, by changing you, another motive in order to work for unity. Sometimes when you know people longer, sometimes it's harder to get along with them. Maybe they were easier to, to get along with the first year you knew them, or the first two years you knew them. But as they get to know them longer, perhaps with some, it can grade on you more, or cause uh, chafe on you more. That is all the more important for you to remember these ones, these ones that we share in one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, who, and one Father who is working in us, through us, in order to so communicate to the world what the work of reconciliation looks like. How can we say that we love God if we don't uh, love God? How can we say that we love God who we don't see if we don't love our brother who we do see? And so, we remember the last part of this description. He's above all, he's through all, verse 6, and he's in you all. In you all. We remember back in chapter 2, verse 22, we read that this morning, that we exist as the church in whom, in verse two, chapter, two, chapter 2, verse 22, in whom you also were being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, that we are the true temple. We are the dwelling place of the living God. And so this reality, these realities are the truths 
that are to motivate us, encourage us, help us in order to be unified. Because being unified is hard work. It's hard work in order to be a peacemaker. It's hard work in order to help people be reconciled. So what we've seen today in both sermons, the sermon from this morning and the sermon this evening, is that these things are essential for us to be unified. We cannot be unified without these realities. Without these ones, there is just um, being nice. It's just being nice. You know what happens when, nice, when lost people try and be nice? <laughs> They're not really nice. <laughs> it's called hypocrisy. You smile to the face, and you know they think another thing, and they talk another thing behind your back. And you've been in those circumstances where you know somebody just gives you a plastic smile, and you think, I just want to get out of this scenario. I don't want to hang out with this person anymore, because it's all fake. It's all fake. That's not what the church is. The church is not just us being nice to one another. These things are the realities, these doctrinal truths are the realities that, that uh, bind us together, that bind us together. And so how, because we, we share in these things, we must, we must walk worthy of our calling. We must persevere in this hard work. And these realities encourage us in God's purposes, that he plans for us to be unified. He plans for us to be unified. Let's go to Psalm 133. Psalm 133. This is a classic text on the unity of the body of Christ. You'll remember it as soon as we begin to read it. Psalm 133. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. It's a very simple psalm, right? It begins with, one, with three easy points. One, verse one, you see how good and pleasant unity is. In two, we have the illustration of the oil running down the beard of Aaron. In, in verse three, we have the illustration of the water of the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. In verse 1, we see when it says how good and how pleasant is unity. There is an experiential pleasant and there is a moral beauty and goodness to unity. When we're unified together as a body, we can say that was a good experience. And we can say how pleasant and good, morally pleasant and morally good it is. To be unified. And we look at the uh, illustration, the two illustrations here, and sometimes they can be hard to understand. As an American, maybe we would read run, oil running down the beard and think, uh, well, why doesn't he go take a shower or something? You, you would, it would get oily all over you. But we remember that this is a symbol here for the priesthood and a symbol of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, with the priest. And so it was a, a blessing that normally included fragrant uh, aspects or fragrant spices to it. Uh, so maybe in our context you could think of a, a nice perfume or a nice cologne, but in, the significance is greater. It communicates the Holy Spirit with you in the ministry. So what is unity? Unity is like the blessing of having the Holy Spirit with you. Unity is the manifestation of his, the Spirit's work amongst us. 
And he doesn't work that way in all. He doesn't work that way in your lost family. He doesn't work that way at your job. He doesn't work that way in other religious groups. Only in the true church of God. And we see the third in verse 3. It's like the dew of Hermon. Descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Life forevermore. And so we remember the, one, the blessing coming from one mountain to another. The water coming from one mountain to another. Communicating the blessing of God. And that true unity is given by God. Remember how we talked about this morning, how it's from the Spirit. We don't create it, but we're called to preserve it. So let's begin to close here now with the exposition of these verses and begin to consider, again, some more applications. Some more applications. What does this mean for you? What does this mean for you? You need to pray for unity. In Psalm 122, we're, we're called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And if you consider how that is to be applied to us today, that's not just praying for um, Israel and Palestine. That's praying for the work in the people of God. It's praying for the work of the people of God and for the peace in the, uh, what applies now in the church. In the church. So we need to pray for unity. We need to pray for unity. And remember that we are members of the same body and we u- and, uh, love one another. We need to serve. You know how you be unified with people? Go and serve with them. It's an amazing thing, right? When you stop sitting there complaining and you get up and you do something with someone, how God unites your heart together with them. I didn't just make that up. Look at Ephesians 4, verses 7 to 16. What does it talk about? Spiritual gifts, serving one another. It goes on explaining how we're to be disciples, making disciples. It's not a coincidence that churches who are disciples, who make disciples, naturally have a unity about them. And so go and surf. Discern. You must be discerning. We have went through a bunch of doctrinal categories here today. If you don't truly understand how to be able to discern some, in someone, if they have the Spirit, if they have the true faith communicated in doctrine, if they, ha- don't, they have the same Lord and submit to the same Lord, if, you don't be, if you're not able to discern these categories, then you won't be able to discern who do you have unity with. So you must apply discernment if you're to apply verses 4 to 6. You must communicate biblically. Communicate biblically. You must forgive. You must forgive. Lastly, you must leave churches in a unified way. You must leave churches in a unified way. I'll read you some advice from a pastor that read in a blog at uh, Cripplegate. Um, pastors don't normally talk about how to leave churches. Maybe it makes them a little bit nervous of uh, giving people excuses about why to leave. I'm going to give you counsel on how to leave a church, which is a strange thing for a pastor. Here's some wisdom on how to leave a church. Ensure that your reasons for leaving are biblical. So how would you do that? You consider the importance of the doctrine that you're leaving over. The importance of the doctrine you're leaving over. Or if you're leaving for doctrine at all and not something worse. Are you leaving for something that's that's doctrine? Have you worked to the point of sweat for unity? If you've not worked to the point of sweat for unity and you, you don't have a clear understanding of the doctrinal difference, then you should not leave. So ensure that the reasons that you're leaving for are biblical. Have you considered those categories? Next, get advice from your own church leaders first before making your decision. You don't go to them and say, I made this decision, here it is. Um, you can't uh, fire, fire me, I quit. I think that's how it works. So consider, even if you don't agree with your spiritual leaders, and even if you're leaving because of them, 
Show them the, the respect to listen to them. Next, be sure you're leaving in a good, in a good standing, biblically speaking. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. Make sure you're leaving in good standing, biblically speaking. Next, how to leave a church. How to leave a church. In order to leave in a unified way, if it comes to that. Do what you can to find and equip a church member to replace you in the way you're serving. Don't just leave and hand them the, the bag or leave the bag at the door. Consider how to serve the people that you've been serving here by finding someone to replace you. Ask your church leaders to con what's the next step, what to consider for the next local church before leaving. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 5. Consider leaving with a transfer letter from your elders. Romans 16, verses 1 to 2. At the end of Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 21 to 22. And lastly, express gratitude to those who have poured over you, those who have spent time with you. Leaving a church is not an easy thing to do. But how do, when it comes to that, how do you leave in a biblical way? Communicate. Work at it. Get advice. Ask people for, be humble and listen. Even if you're leaving in, in disagreement. Listen. Show, express gratitude. Consider leaving with a commendation. If you leave this way, then you can leave with commendation. I've been around the block enough to know that uh, I can't just preach to you and assume that next year everybody's going to be here. I would like it if that were to be so. But uh, I want to give you these things so that you, it's part of what it means to be unified in the body of Christ. That sometimes, sadly, in this time, Paul and Barnabas is split. So if you're truly a Christian, leave like a Barnabas and don't leave like a Demas. That's my counsel to you. And that's a good application from this text, okay? So we looked at today um, some good applications some good reminders about how to keep church unity, our responsibility. Let's remember the grace of God that he's given us, and let's re let the gospel motivate us to do this hard work, this hard work. Like I said in the, in, when I, we were praying, it's a lot easier to pray about it or preach about it than it is to do it. So let's pray for the grace of God again to do it. Dear Lord, we want to confess that uh, we're a prideful people. We are a, um, a people, a forgetful people. We forget these realities that you've, uh, how you've united us together with one spirit, one body, one Lord, one Father, one hope, one baptism, one faith. Too often we, we forget about these most important realities. Please help us to see the moral and experiential value of unity. We want you to be glorified, Jesus, and we know that when we're not unified, then, then that is dishonoring to you. Dishonoring to you. We pray, Lord, that you would work in our lives and even the lives of, of people who, uh, that we're not in unity with now so that we would be able to be unified. Please help us to do all that is uh, possible for us to do and to trust the rest in your hands. We, we pray for your grace to be able to do that, and we thank you for this day to worship you. Amen.